Hello everyone, my name is Ashley and I am a machine learning program manager at Google. And I'm Lawrence and I'm a machine learning developer advocate at Google. And we are both people of AI. So join us as we meet some of the most interesting people in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. You will meet leaders, practitioners, amateurs in the field of AI and ML and how they ended up where they are today, what they have learned along the way, and their outlook on the future. Sounds exciting, shall we do it? Let's jump right in. This podcast is sponsored by Google. Any remarks made by the speakers are their own and are not endorsed by Google. Okay, we are thrilled today to welcome Gant Laborde. Gant is the owner of Infinite Red and author of the popular O'Reilly book, Learning TensorFlow JS. By day, he is a mentor, adjunct professor, and award-winning speaker. For 20 years, he has been involved in software development and is recognized as a Google developer expert in web and machine learning. By night, he is known as an open sorcerer, aspiring future mad scientist, illustrator, and appears as an avatar in his latest children's book dedicated to his daughter and wife. We are so excited to have you on the podcast, Gant. Thank you for being here. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, Gantz. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super happy to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you. We've already had a lot of laughs and we're only just getting started. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's always fun once you get these you know, smart people together. It's the stuff that we're going to come up with, uh, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> Epic. Well, from what I know of you so far, you seem mm -hmm. like the nicest most genuine person. And so tell us how oh. this got started. Like, take us back to when you were, oh. you know, a kid. And we'd love to get to know you a little bit here. I'm carefully taking notes. Yes. Yeah, well, I really, I appreciate that very much. I've been in software for over 20 years. It's been quite an adventure. It actually wasn't at all what my dad wanted me to do. I was supposed to be a football player. So if you've ever seen Gant in person, I look like, a little bit like you wouldn't want to sit next to me in the airplane. Uh, <laughs> I'm not swole. I'm just big. And so what ends up happening is uh, he wanted me to be a football player and I wanted to be into computers because I loved playing Nintendo games. And so he said, hey, if you wrestle, I will buy uh, you a computer. And so this deal was struck and I wrestled for an entire year against like what I wanted to do. And then he bought me a Pentium computer and that's where it all just went crazy from there. I finally got my own computer, uh, immediately started writing QBasic programs and Visual Basic 6 programs and all kinds of things that should never be written and terrible games. <laughs> and then from there, I just was addicted. I was building websites, Macromedia Flash games, PHP, ASP, ASP.net. Wow. And it eventually got me all kinds of jobs that helped me pay for my own college to get a computer science degree. Wow. So graduated from that. And then honestly, here in New Orleans, it is such a fun place to be. It is not a place for technology. <laughs> so I think it's a great idea to come here and enjoy all kinds of things. But I, I was sort of technology starved. And then fortunately enough, I'll say that the best thing that happened was open source uh, software. And that introduced me to people around the world, got me speaking at conferences around the world, got me involved in actually connecting and interacting with people about things that are really, really exciting. Wow. What a story. I think I remember hearing that you like your aha moment was when you took your dad's computer, which you weren't supposed to be mm -hmm. on, and you programmed like, yeah. hello, Gant. And I think yes. I'm hearing this theme and both you, Lawrence, and you can't have this aha moment where you're like, oh, I have this love of computers. And so if you can, if it's possible to dive deeper into like what was so cool about having oh, the yeah. computer say like, hello, again, because I'm in this field and I'm, I'm here to stay and I like I want to be converted. Please convert me. Right now, I am worried about a new generation of people not actually getting that experience the same way that yeah, uh, a lot of right. us did. Because one of the things that happened was I had a Nintendo, my neighbor had a Sega, and we would sit there and we'd play with the controllers. And it was, you were very limited on what you wanted to do. But those home games were the free version of what was really cool that was really out there is that you go to an arcade and then you'd have to lose five bucks as a kid, which was 
really hard to do. <laughs> and you're putting all your money in there just to play these games. And you just kind of get here at home. It starts to feel closer. It starts to feel more connected. Mm. I used to actually pick up the controllers and pretend I was controlling people on TV. I think everybody probably <laughs> did that back in the day. It was just kind of fun to pretend to have this, 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 this effect in the world. And the aha moment you're talking about is quite specifically, yeah, I wasn't supposed to be on my dad's computer. He was very anti-computers. Absolutely. And I got on there and then in QBasic making it say, hello, Gantt, that was a moment where it went the other way, right? I actually wanted to control it. I wanted to change what was happening on the screen. I wanted to make my own thing. And I felt that effect. And what I got to see, which a lot of new people don't get to see, is those computers starting to show up everywhere. And they start mm -hmm. to show up in new and more exciting places and change lives and change businesses and change governments. It's a big revolutionary change that's happening, and especially uh, part of the reason why I'm so excited with, like I always talk about artificial intelligence, is because I'm seeing that exciting hey, you could do something that changes the world in any given moment, uh, sort of excitement coming out every month now. But what I'd say is we have a lot of want to have the actions that we're doing have some kind of real meaningful effect in the world, some significant positive impact. And a majority of the things that we say and we do, sometimes they get deleted. They, you know, you change phones and you lost old files and all these things start to feel like you're not actually making a, a relevant effect. And I think that when your aha moment, wherever it is, the evolution of the aha moment where a computer says hi to me for the first time, is when you see that you've made a significant positive effect. And when that is something that you touch, you grab on and you never let go. That's beautiful. And it <laughs> makes so much sense. I think for me also, because I got into computers late in my life, that for mm -hmm. me, like, iPhone was already there, computers, like I had a laptop and, you know, in high school and, and for me, it kind of just felt like a part of life already. And so I think that realization of having access to something new, which I kind of, I'm kind of envious of that in many ways. Well, it's happening. It's just, it can't be scripted. So Lawrence's story is very different from my story, which is very different from the person who started programming right when iPhone apps were popular and wrote one of the first smart mobile apps and was able to take a phone out their pocket and show somebody something. Like, if you do that today, everybody just kind of goes, yeah, and? <laughs> <laughs> but there was some app, I think, when iPhone first came out, there was like $9,000. It was like the $9,000 app. And all it did was show that you were able to buy it or something. <laughs> and it was, that's all it was. I don't think was they like let that in the store club. anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's yeah. allowed. But like that was an app idea. And it was just people yeah. actually spent tons and tons of money just to show that they had this connection there. And what I'll say is no one's going to be able to tell us what the next, right, we can all guess. And I do think that, uh, I, like I said, I think AI is doing things no one's ever done before. So it's that right. exciting place again. But it's it's not going to be um, the same and you can't follow it exactly. But what happens is I wouldn't per se uh, follow the story, but I would follow the plot. Yeah, it's like history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Right. So it's like, That's, and I think there are mm, beautifully said. Yeah, perfect. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are times in history when the industry is at a place where anybody can get in and get started and have that aha moment where the barriers of entry are low. I mean, for me, right. it's like similar to Gantt. I got my first computer was an old 8 bit computer in the early 1980s. <laughs> and when you looked at the video games that you would buy and you looked at the stuff that you could program, even as a little kid, I could look at this and go, that's not out of my reach. You know, I mm -hmm. could like start coding and create like a simple Pong game. And that was probably the best game that you would buy on your Atari system and, you know, and stuff like that. And I started coding and seeing that this stuff isn't out of my reach, I had that aha moment and was able to succeed in it. You know, and then that, that history has rhymed a few times since then, like probably the advent mm -hmm. of the internet was the first one where people were going, yep. oh my gosh, I can write some code and put it on a web server. And now people type, you know, www. you know, lawrencemoroni.com and they're actually seeing stuff. Mm -hmm. And then as Gan yeah. pointed out, I think the next one was mobile, right? The first wave of mm. mobile phone apps were quite primitive. They were written by one person teams. 
and you know anybody could do them but now most apps are written by huge companies you know with artists and music and sound designers and ux designers and all that in them because it's you know it's reached that point of maturity and it's hard for one person to get in to do that i think the current wave of that is as gan pointed out is ai when you start looking at hey there's great stuff out there being done in ai it's amazing stuff and you can roll up your sleeves and in a few hours you can be doing the kind of things that you needed to be a state-of-the-art lab to do two years ago and it's incredible and it's amazing and hopefully many people are having those aha moments and you know having a productive life out of it yeah i want to zoom out and you know with all the incredible experience that you've had and different roles as well you took us all the way up to college where you finally got into your computer science degree was it like love at first sight you're like that's what i'm shooting for i want to be it's not like computer science was, but when did machine learning kind of introduce itself? And was this sort of like a meandering path that kind of just took you there by surprise? Or were you like, that's the mountain, that's the trail, that's what I'm going to do? So uh, quite specifically, I love going into these avenues that are exciting and fun and cool and creative. Building something that is unique or something that is specifically never been done before is always really fun and exciting for me. And uh, quite actually, I, I was watching a TV show <laughs> and the TV show had a hot dog, not hot dog app in it. As you remember, <laughs> Silicon Valley. I remember the show. And, yes. Yes. And that was written in React Native. And, and I'm, I'm very fluent in React Native. It was no problem whatsoever. But I read the blog post on exactly how they did that in React Native. And that was the first mention of AI frameworks. And it was one of those moments where I was reading it and I was feeling dumb. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand any of this. And I was like, that's not a real thing. It's not a real app. And it was. It was released to the store. It was absolutely something that could be done. Oh, wow. uh, the TV show's app was something I was doing on my phone. And that moment was like, I don't know how this works, but I have the bookends on it, right? I have it in my hands. I have what's going on. I know the technology that they used. I'm going to crack this open and I'm going to solve this. And I went about that the worst way possible. I dove into hours and hours of linear algebra. <laughs> 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 It's oh, okay. It was okay. I came out the other side. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I realize <laughs> It was, you know, linear algebra gets a bad rap. It's actually way more fun. Uh, and it's the nerdiest thing I could possibly say right now. But <laughs> uh, what wound up happening <laughs> is uh, once seeing that that was possible, I was like, what else is possible? What else can I build? What are the other things I can do? And it was a headlong dive into AI, machine learning, all these other aspects, and building simple apps from taking courses on Coursera, reading books, doing all the math again that I'd forgotten in college, and <laughs> coming out the other side and saying, OK, I can somewhat wield this power on the other side, building things that can identify what food is this, using models that existed, and then start customizing uh, models and training them myself. It was such an exciting moment to get out on the other side of it. And then once you are steeped in what can be done, there was a document I started of ideas and the document grew bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I built quite a few of these things. But at some point I realized I, I, this is this is what I'm into. This is my future. This is what I have to make. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really fun. And once you've kind of find that I'm never, ever going to finish all those apps that I've ever written down, it was it was really cool to come out the other side. So I think there's a lot of new paths forward. If people are afraid of linear algebra, they don't have to anymore. <laughs> but it's just sort of the way I kind of solve problems. I get down into the ground level of things and start building it up. Once you come up from that, you feel like you can do anything. So I would love to grab a magic wand and <laughs> both of you are now back to being teenagers or even younger. <laughs> Do you think you would be as interested in AI or machine learning as you are now? Or do you think it's because it's becoming, I mean, there is that when the technology is not so new and becomes more popular and more accessible, the newness and excitement also comes out. Because it is just sort of mm -hmm. like mainstream, right? Like when the first iPhone came out, I was like, oh my gosh, this is huge. And now like, you know, smartphones mm -hmm. are everywhere. So do you think 
you would be as enchanted as you were? I think that one thing that's really interesting is that the jobs that are coming up are jobs that haven't been invented yet. Mm -hmm. And so the interests that are coming up are interests that we don't even know that we have. For instance, when you're taking a look at oil painters or looking at one person say, oh, this isn't a real oil painter. They're not doing this and that. And then you have the artists and they say, that's not a real artist. You know, you opened Photoshop. And it's like, you're a digital artist. That's not even a real job. Go to school, learn art. But then digital art becomes a thing. And now mm -hmm. we have uh, new things. I'd say like, probably I would have been interested because there would have been this I feel like there's this burgeoning topic of an AI artist, a person who is a prompt engineer who can identify how to go ahead and get all these tools to work together, how to in paint and out paint in order to get specifically choreographed things, as well as how to finally refine it so that it makes sense. I think that what's going to happen is people are going to get pulled into these categories in these new currents that are coming through and these will pull people further out there now whether their aha moment is when they create something and everybody says there's no way you can create that and they're like i made 10 of those last night <laughs> you know and they feel this connection they touch that live wire and then they continue to go forward but i don't know specifically if i have found this same path forward the doors close as we go forward so i think mm -hmm. what's really exciting to me is people who are ready for change who are ready for seeing the changes as they come there will be lots of opportunities for them and I think hopefully 13 year old me would see that and jump in with the whole new wave. I absolutely agree with that. And I think, you know, one of the things that Gantz has touched on is whenever there's something that happens to widen access, there's always going to be gatekeepers who don't like the access being widened. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, it's good to listen to the gatekeepers because they may have some valid concerns, but it's also, you have to realize that people are being gatekeepers in that way. And, you know, you're right. talking about like digital art and prompt engineering and that type of thing. It's like, you know, the people that I've introduced that to are people who never previously would have had access to have really good art in their lives mm -hmm. and for stuff that they're doing. Like one person who has a podcast that he does with kids now does amazing art with that. And he wouldn't have had that before. He would never have hired an artist to do that. You know, and now he has this amazing and beautiful art that he's able to do with his podcasts and to, you know, and to, to build up and enlighten people around kids and technology in his podcasts. And, you know, we've widened access to someone like him through AI to be able to do things that they, he couldn't previously do. And, you know, that's the part that excites me. And it's the same thing that I say. The question is, like, when you're a kid, in many ways, it's the same thing, because for me, when I was a kid, it was the access to just the concept of being near a computer and being able to do something called programming mm -hmm. had moved from, you know, expensive companies or labs to an average working class person's home in like a small town in Ireland, you know, and like I, I now have yeah. the ability to program and the access to that was widened to me and was able to, you know, this whole new branch of technology and this whole new branch of employment that came out that people had never even heard of, you know, is now something that I get to enjoy. Interesting because it, it's cropping up in a lot of the different stories that we've been hearing and the, the different folks that we've been talking to. But it is this feeling of accessibility and using this technology to open up opportunities, whether it's drawing or painting or learning, going from one industry into another. And I'd love to hear more about that excitement. And also, this is the current excitement and what's currently so cool about this technology. But where do you foresee it going? Or what do you think is, you know, now I'm giving you the wand and saying, here, paint a picture for me of the future. I'm sort of doing a wand theme here. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many fun things that could be made, but... Every so often, people stumble across things that make life better in a small way. And I think that's part of what this going wide part is, is I've got this many ideas, but I only have so much time. What happens when a bunch of application developers, web developers, uh, just sort of people who their job is to make things to make life better are empowered by this. That's the future that I think is going to be extremely exciting because you're going to do something. And for instance, you want to listen to an audiobook, but it hasn't been read by a professional person yet. Well, 
AI will read it for you. You go to get your groceries and they take a picture of your door and they're about to leave and their phone goes, hey, that doesn't look like the right door. You know, and it, with the computer vision says, you dropped that off on the wrong door. We have an anomaly detection. Oh, oh, you know what? You're right. I got the address wrong. And then, you know, that person's life is better. And of course, me trying to receive my groceries is also better. <laughs> so there's all these ways where we bring it in to existing services. And once you start to salt and pepper into existing services, it's like having an assistant for life. Mm -hmm. I love that. So. We've been to the past, which we'll hopefully continue to explore, and we just went to the future. So I'd love to go to the present, and I'd love to know for our listeners who might not be familiar with you and what you do, how about you tell us what you actually currently presently do? <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I am fortunately the chief innovation officer for a consulting company where we are building a lot of mobile apps, specifically technologies like React Native. And then also uh, we get to build really fun products and I bring in cool technologies like MediaPipe, TensorFlow, TensorFlow.js. We do some open source repositories for that. But one of the things that we're doing is I get to help run this wonderful team and research really cool technologies and even write amazing books like the learning tensorflow js book which lawrence did the forward for so i appreciate that greatly one of the things i really enjoy is we we tackle complex problems and i get to keep building these really fun uh futuristic applications and leading our team to crack the, some of those problems themselves uh, but I, I like the research and development part of that myself <laughs> You know, one of the things you're really at the forefront of globally is really machine learning in the browser. You know, you've written this, mm -hmm. this seminal book on TensorFlow.js and, you know, you, like you mentioned, you've done these examples and you do this kind of working with browser frameworks and that. It's like, where do yeah. you see that going and what, what's particularly exciting oh, about that? I could tell you, uh, I love it. We had this one client come to us and I'm not allowed to say who the client was, but you could probably infer some of this, what they wanted to have was a makeup transfer model where you would put the makeup in, you know, you would actually, instead of choosing makeup, you would choose a look and you would select the look that's done by a professional beautician and it would apply it in the webcam directly to your face immediately. And it was so wow. cool. And then when you just say like, I want to purchase this look and that's what your cart would have. And it was really cool, but it was extremely complicated technology at the time. It was super difficult uh, to get all that to work in the web browser, uh, but it was such a great selling point. And that's just one example. You can come up with a hundred different ways how something like that would help push a product or, or make that happen. Now, you know, with the learning of like browsers and TensorFlow.js, we could rewrite that same project way easier today. It would be very, very, very simple. And one of the amazing things about that is that I think the idea that we have all these amazing, really cool models was the fun thing to do for a while. And you had everybody had their secret sauce model. Now they're starting to just appear everywhere. They're going much more on edge devices. And I think it's way more important to sort of get these models directly on someone's browser so that you can sell your products, so that you can create your experience, so that you can identify what you need to identify. And you're not paying a fortune in microservices or slowing them down or getting huge server fees. You have an experience that you push directly to somebody's browser, and then you keep certain parts for your server. I see machine learning definitely is going to need that as well. You're going to have some parts, but if you want federated learning or some of these other aspects of pushing these models out to these edge devices and learning from and getting it better and better, I can't imagine that Every time I'm writing an email in Gmail, it's going to do a call to a server every single time. I could be having all of this experience and immediate feedback. And also there's a privacy uh, benefit that sort of comes out of this too that I really, really love because right. we enjoy all of our filters. We enjoy that stuff. But if it's sending everything off to a server every single time, not only is there a lag, but you don't hold your data anymore. And I think that that's a big concern. So I think to answer your question, where I see this all going is the edge devices uh, enhancing the experience and seeing models kind of go wide. Thousands of models everywhere running on client machines, improving experiences. Sounds fantastic. And yeah, I do really want to touch on the, the privacy point that you mentioned yeah. there, because like, remember, a lot of this is data driven. 
So like if the mm -hmm. model is running much more close to you and your hands and your eyes, you know, be it on a mobile device or on your laptop within the browser or something like that, than on a distant yeah. server that, you know, even something trivial, like you mentioned, like makeup trying on, right? You know, yeah. I bet you tested that and there's lots of pictures of you with lots of makeup on that you don't want anybody <laughs> to see. <laughs> you know? They're all and in then, the pull requests, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I mean, I mean, I know that's a trivial example and a kind of a, a, mm -hmm. a funny one, but I mean, you can see whether there be potentially many areas where you just don't want that data to be on a server mm -hmm. somewhere, even with the best intentions around security, bad things can happen. Yeah, as a matter of fact, during uh, the pandemic, I created this one website called Enjoying the Dot Show. And I created it simply because I was losing my mind on the fact that I would do virtual presentations and I couldn't look at my audience anymore. So I'm used to doing a presentation right. and seeing a room full of people. So I created Enjoying the Dot Show and I could create a room where everybody could open their laptops and turn on the webcams and it would do sentiment analysis on everybody's face, but it would do that on their machine. And then all it would send to the server is happy, neutral, sad, you know, disgusted, of course, was one of the options. And <laughs> so what happens is I, while presenting, just had a pie chart that would slowly change. So if I told a joke, it would go from neutral to purple, which meant that everybody was laughing. And if I told, uh, if I said, oh, take a look at how long this takes to download, I could actually see the reaction of people's faces in a pie chart. It was really cool. But what happens is I never got anybody's face. It never mm -hmm. left their machine. It was just little strings of happy, sad, or whatever coming from multiple machines and getting aggregated into a single pie chart. And the website's still available. If anybody wants to try that, just looking at themselves, you can go to enjoyingthe.show, open one browser window, <laughs> and then watch <laughs> the room on another. And uh, you might look kind of crazy. <laughs> Suggest do that at home, not the airport. But uh, <laughs> it's a cool idea. You could actually have that up at the same time. Oh, that's genius. <laughs> yeah, that's a brilliant example, right, of like the distributed intelligence, right, to do the stuff yeah. that you need to do locally. And then, you know, it also saves a lot of money and bandwidth, right? You're not like yeah. broadcasting these streams of people's faces and, you know, and then do the stuff that you need to do on the server, which is the aggregation of the sentiment. It's like, that's fantastic. Well, we were talking about sort of what you, you know, your your current work and the things that you're building, like genius things mm -hmm. that you're building. Um, but I also know that you are a Google developer expert and shameless yes. plug for our developer relations team. I would love for you to maybe talk about a little bit about what that means yeah. and what you do as a Google developer expert. Yeah, what I could tell you is that there are a lot of different places trying to do expert programs out there. And I do think the Google Developer Expert program is one of the best. Absolutely. Hands down. I love it because, first of all, you go through three rounds to make sure that you can actually get into Google Developer Expert. And some of those questions that they ask you are about the technology. Of course, you want to make sure that you fit the technology. But a little bit of the questions are to make sure that you are ethically aligned with some of the values mm -hmm. to be a representative as sort of like they don't want anybody to be a part of that that's not looking to give back to the community. And I think what's great about the Google Developer Expert program is going through it, getting set, and then a lot of the attraction to it for me was meeting other Google Developer Experts and saying, okay, I've met this person, this person, and this person, this person. Now I'm excited. And so if you're looking to get more networked amongst experts, to be empowered to network amongst experts, and to uh, sort of earn the badge, you know, like some right. trophies mean nothing to people because they found a trophy store, right? right? The Google Developer Expert community means something and you have to earn it year after year to stay inside. Right. And I think that those are the best organizations because they take care of the people that are in there. They make sure that they're doing everything they can to connect you. And of course, there's a once a year group that you can all go to the same location, but I wound up joining right before the pandemic. So <laughs> we're nearing the end of our time together. And so um, I know, I know this is really lovely. Um, so what is your favorite AI movie? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. 
Let's see. I am a big fan of Tony Stark. <laughs> if you watch the Marvel movies, I don't know if you know this, but there's a really amazing aspect that every time he failed in a battle, that's what he improved in his next movie, in the next suit. And so if you watch it, you say like, oh, this is how he lost this. And it's not what happens the next time. He actually adds improvements to the suit. And they seem random, but they are specifically tied to the past failures. And I think that's really beautiful in a sense, oh. but I would like to have, be like that and have my own Jarvis. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Great answer. I never noticed that. I have to watch them again and see that. Well, I think that completes our podcast for today. Thank you so much, Gant, for joining us today. We finally made it happen. This is so exciting and yeah. it was well worth the wait. Uh, such a pleasure <laughs> to have you. And thank you so much. Thank you, Gant. Amazing as always. Oh, thank you very much for having me.